Well, we're continuing on our series. We're talking about uh, the book of Acts, and today I'm going to be in Acts, the sixth chapter. The, my message title is Envisioned with God's Glory. So I encourage you to take your, take your Bible or your smartphone. How many of you follow along on your iPad, your smartphone? That way you can check the news, the sports scores, and who won the Kentucky Derby, all that kind of stuff right in church. You get inspired by something anyway. Now this, this happened to me last week. No, have you ever had your smartphone become a smart aleck phone? I was on my way. I was in Kingsport, Tennessee two weeks ago, and I was in High Point, North Carolina last week speaking in churches. Every time, I cannot remember the exit to Greg DePriest Church there at, at Christ Fellowship. So I did that Google thing. You know, you, you hit the button. I got a, I've got a smartphone now, and it's a six. Just so you all know, I'm in the 21st century. And I push the button, you know, where you do that Google thing, and it's, it, it's got the wavy lines where you, and I said, Christ Fellowship Church, Kingsport, Tennessee. This is no joke. You know, she talks back to you too. And she says, that is a topic for another day and another assistant. <laughs> and you ever, you ever get mad at your smart aleck phone? It's kind of interesting. You'd be talking along like this, just normal, you know, just stuff like that. But when you Google, you yell into it real loud where everybody in the whole airplane or mall or whatever can hear you. So I looked at it, and rather than speaking in other languages at it, I just said, Christ fellowship, you know, real loud like that. And she comes back and says, my policy is not to mix spirit with silicon. So don't try it now, but after service, try Christ fellowship and see if it gives you the same answer. I have a feeling that there is some kind of a conspiracy against me. Anyway, I told the church that it was worth a lawsuit against Google if they wanted a little bit of extra money. I'm going to be talking this morning about being envisioned with God's glory. And the goal of this message today is to help us to see how that circumstances that may appear negative or derogatory, circumstances that may be perplexing, confusing, discouraging, can turn and do often turn to uh, being able to see God at work in the midst of it. And so there can be an, a positive outcome. And, and I'm, I'm going to try to define this to you, that that positive outcome is our ability to see God's glory. Just to see God's glory. So I'm just going to walk through these scriptures with you today. We're going to talk about this next segment, what's taking place in the book of Acts, beginning with Acts, the sixth chapter, the first verse. In those days, when the number of the disciples was increasing, so the great growth in the church, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained that the Hebraic Jews, uh, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of spirit and wisdom. Just note that. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So we see right here that in, in the Acts 6 chapter, after some persecution initially that takes place after uh, the resurrection, after Pentecost has come, after the church has been born, all of a sudden you have this in, incredible expansion of the church. Right? We can say that the church is flourishing, church is growing. It could be say that the, the, the people that are actually settling into a rather comfortable, successful life as believers. They have not been called Christians yet. They're just simply called believers. They're following Jesus of Nazareth. And they are, uh, that this man who came and died and rose again, they're following him, they're preaching his message, and it's incredible what is taking place. And there has been some persecution, but mostly right now, growth and favor. We're, we, we are told, uh, historians say, that this incident takes place about probably somewhere within the year, maybe a year after, the, after Pentecost. 
And sometimes we look at the early church and we say, you know, it was just all a bed of roses. You know, we look through rose-colored glasses. Everything is just fine. It was wonderful. Miracles, blessings, favor, and all of that are taking place. People just didn't care. They were just kind of uh, out there footloose and fancy free, enjoying the blessings of God, that type of thing. But that's not really the case. It was not a 24-7 camp meeting. There are problems. And some of the problems that arose, or one of them arose, was this fact that the Hellenistic Jews, these are the people who had come from the Grecian culture who, were, uh, who, who, were, who, who came and, and became a part of the commonwealth of Israel, believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and now had become believers. Now they were following Jesus. Uh, they were not getting their fair share. And so there's an argument that arises about that. And, uh, and so what I think that we need to see is that in the midst of this, uh, the problem presents actually the potential, the potential for a positive plan to be put together and Luke's intention, by the way, here is not to show us uh, how to develop a deacon board, but to show us and to use this occasion uh, to re uh, introduce what God was doing through a difficult problem, a difficult problem. And it was, we could call it a menial task, to wait upon tables. But uh, it's interesting, the apostle said, for this particular task, we need men who are filled with the Spirit and filled with wisdom. Filled with the Spirit and filled with the wisdom. People who have aligned themselves with the vision that we have. And so this is what we encourage you to do. Let's go read on. Acts the 6th chapter, the 5th verse. This proposal pleased the whole group. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Now that's interesting because now Stephen pops out and emerges because he's the chief uh, character in this particular narrative. And also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch. And notice that every one of these men who are chosen are actually uh, Greeks who have converted to Judaism and who have now become believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So in order to take care of the problem, God has given them the wisdom to choose out uh, the people, to choose out people who would actually, uh, would actually take care of those whom they represented. It says they presented these men to the apostles, and they prayed over them, and they laid hands on them. And I, I think that that is so important for us to see, is that now they're praying over them, laying hands over them, it's not a menial task. There's no such thing as the separation between the secular and the sacred. And may I say to you that whatever you do in life, that is not your secular work, that is your sacred work. And so I think that Jesus comes along to help us break down that barrier and, and displace or dissolve the myth between the sacred and the secular. Because whatever we do, we do as unto the Lord. You know, here at Christ's family, we, we have a vision, and that is that people, and those, that vision is found in these four words, worship and connect, grow, and serve. We want people to work. We want people to have an experience with God. Connect, we want people to find friends. Grow, we want people growing in Christ. And, and, and then serving, we want people to serve. And there is no task that is menial. There's no task that does not require and we all know this, does not require the Holy Spirit and wisdom. If you, if you, if you don't believe that, ask uh, the nursery workers. That takes the Holy Spirit, right? And I might just throw out there that we need a few more Holy Spirit-filled nursery workers. Can't understand why y'all don't like little babies. No, I'm just teasing. But we do need some back there. I just thought I would throw that in there, honey, just for case. You give me a big pat on the back later on, maybe a kiss on the cheek or whatever or something. Or even more, who knows, you know. But we, 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 we want everyone to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, these ushers, they got to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you know. You may have some cantankerous person come in one day. I remember we had somebody come in one day, and, and brand new people were sitting on the chairs there, and he came up and said, you're sitting on my seat. Said, well, that takes somebody full of the Holy Ghost 
and, and maybe a little bit more of something else to handle. Take some wisdom to handle both things. I know you can sit there and you, you can go, you can, no, you can go over here. You know. Let me read on. Well, let, before we read on, let me just say this. These people who are chosen, we would be called, they would be called in modern terminology, lay people. That's the laity. You've got the ministry and the laity. You know, we're all in ministry. There is no real laity and ministry. We're all in this together. We have different places. And whereas we celebrate the gift of leadership, we at the same time celebrate the gift of ministry in the church. And may I say this, that I believe the next great move of God in our country is going to occur in the marketplace. I really believe that. When I speak of the marketplace, I'm talking about out there in society. And of course God will move in the church. The church has a special place, and that is to be people who in a place where people are equipped. But uh, the church is going to be carried out into social circles and places of business activity, I believe, in a profound way. And just as Stephen begins to experience this, as we will read here, we will experience that as well. Now, that's just my take on it. If it doesn't happen, then you can call me a, a, a false prophet. Just don't call me late to supper, okay? The concept in our culture is this, that preachers and pastors are just simply paid to do what they do. I mean, they get up, they talk about the Bible, they talk about giving, they talk about holy living, they talk about worship, they talk about praying, because th that's just their vocation. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, I believe that it's a concept that is unfounded, but nonetheless, that's what people think of. You know, that's just what they're called to do. They do that type of thing. But I believe this, that when people in the workplace begin to see men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, wherever they are, in every situation, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with wisdom, and filled with faith, because it says here that Stephen... Now, not only is filled with the Holy Spirit, he's a man of faith. So you've got the Holy Spirit, and you've got wisdom on how to utilize the Holy Spirit and to respond to the Holy Spirit in situations, and then you've got faith to believe God for great things. I believe that the most powerful witness that God has is those of you who are sitting here who face people every day, go places I would never go, and touch the lives of people that I could never touch. Because it's not something that you have to do, it's something that you want to do because God has instilled that in you. So let's read on. It says here, So the word of God spread, and the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. A large number of priests became obedient to the faith. That, to me, is phenomenal. It is said that at this particular time, if you took the high priest, if you took the chief priest, you took the priests, and then you took the Levites, all of those from the lineage of Aaron. At that particular time, there were some 18,000 who served in these capacities. These were the religious leaders. They were the leaders in Israel. These are the ones who had to coordinate the efforts of the ongoing uh, commonwealth of Israel under Roman rule. They were spread out, not only in Jerusalem, they spread out from Jerusalem into Judea, into Galilee, into other parts. But nonetheless, most of them probably made that journey of that trip three times a year to come and celebrate in Jerusalem. Large number of people. It is said at this particular time that probably the population of Jerusalem would be around 100,000, 80,000 to 100,000 people. We really don't know. Some estimates are much, much greater than that, upwards toward a million. I don't believe that. I think it would probably be more 100,000, something like that. But when the festivals took place, when the feast took place, there could be three, 400,000 people gathering in Jerusalem. So when this, this thing takes place, that when these priests began to believe in Jesus, uh, that's a phenomenal thing. And what I thought when I read this is that it was just like this one act of obedience, discovering a solution rather than uh, tolerating and rather than entertaining dissension and allowing a, a problem to fester 
and cause division where the word gets around. You know, the Hellenistic, the, the, the Greek widows that are being left behind. It's a terrible thing that the church is doing. The church deals with that and because of that, bingo. There's favor, there's expansion, great things are happening. As a matter of fact, substantial number of priests. Possibly it's when they see this thing is really working. These people care for one another. These people love one another. This love that this Jesus of Nazareth talked about really is real. It's happening. That we read on. On the eighth verse. Now Stephen, now Stephen, Stephen is one of these uh, lay leaders, if you please. Uh, deacons, with the word in the Bible, deacon does not mean somebody that's on a board who tells everybody what to do. But a deacon is actually a servant, somebody who serves in a particular capacity. Uh, it may be noted, too, with the church now growing into the tens of thousands, that the, these were not the only deacons that were chosen in the early church. There could have been others, but these were the ones chosen to deal with this particular problem. A problem presented the potential for a positive plan. And so that's what he's dealing with. I and mean, as I read this, I see that Luke is really setting this up because he's introducing not only Stephen, but he's also introducing another guy named Philip, and most of all, he's introducing the guy who becomes a champion of the faith, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes the Apostle Paul. So listen to this. Stephen, a man full of, of God's grace and power. So now, not only is he a man filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with wisdom and filled with faith, but also grace and power. Grace and power. Campbell, Mac, Mac, Campbell Morgan said, that the grace and power is like sweetness and strength, the combination of those two things in the personality. So he's doing mighty wonders. We don't know what they were, but we do know that the Holy Spirit is moving through him in a powerful way. He's not talking about one of the apostles. He's talking about one of us, one of us ordinary people. God is using him right now. Great wonders are among the people. And then it says opposition arose. Oh, go figure. <laughs> Have you ever tried to do anything from the Lord? Listen, if you want to see opposition, launch out and do what God has called you to do. Okay? Don't be discouraged by it, but go ahead and just expect it. May I say it ahead of time? That it's not going to be a bed of roses. Bill Gaither, a lot of years ago, wrote a song, said it's not a recreation room, it's a battlefield. And, and, and really, that is so true. That... So don't be discouraged. Sometimes people say, well, I'm trying to do what God told me. I, I thought I was called to this, and then all Hades breaks loose. Well, it's going to, at least for a while. And then God gets the glory out of it. Anyway, opposition arose from members of the synagogue of the freedmen. It was a particular synagogue, possibly in the, it was just a group of people. The freedmen were actually people who had been, they were slaves who had been set free, and they had kind of their fraternity among the uh, among uh, Judaistic uh, groups, a lot of groups um, in Judaism, you have to remember that. And it says Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Cilicia and Asia, and they began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. We have these two more descriptive words, power and grace. Holy Spirit is moving through him. They don't like what's happening. They rise up against him. And Jesus had promised them persecution. I think that this is what happened to believers when they were persecuted. They remembered. They remembered. As a matter of fact, in the fourth chapter, when they were persecuted, they just rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer with Jesus. So anyway, persecution comes arises from this group of people. And uh, they just didn't like all this stuff about Jesus and Jesus being the way. And so they began to oppose. Now, I want to remind you, at that time, the center of worship is still the temple. And the believers are gathering in the temple. They have not been cast out of the temple. They are in the temple. So they are there daily. And their witness is coming live. And people are becoming believers. And it's like this, it's just this rush that is taking over. And so, persecution begins. 
hopefully we will never see persecution on the level that the early church uh, experienced. However, I do want to say this to you, that we have many brothers and sisters in the world today, and I'm very humbled to say this, and I think that we all should be humbled to say this, to think about this, that today they are giving their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are there, by the thousands, by the thousands, there were more martyrs in the 20th century than all of Christianity from the beginning, from the previous 20 centuries. In the 20th century, there were more martyrs for the name of Jesus. But I do believe that we are under persecution here. And let me tell you that the persecution, a lot of it is mental, a lot of it is philosophical, a lot of it is theoretical, a lot of it is in the education, uh, in, in, in our education system. It's certainly in our political system. There, there are people who are under, I just spoke to somebody this week that came under an, a tremendous attack from a financial situation, inequity, and injustice. And my question to us today is, can we see God's glory in the midst of all of this? Can we see Him at work? How do we respond to it? If we get mad when somebody cuts us off on the freeway, what are we going to do when we really get persecuted for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ? And I pray that we will be people who can see God's glory in the midst of it. Let's move on. Acts the 6th chapter, the 11th verse. Then they secretly persuaded some of the men to say, we've heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And so they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. That's interesting. The people stirred up the people, stirred up the elders, stirred up the teachers of the law. Both the Pharisees and the Sadducees who comprised this court of the Jews, which was this, of the Jewish religion, which is the Sanhedrin. So they bring him, they seize him, and bring him before the Sanhedrin. And they produce false witnesses who testified this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law, which I, I'm quite sure he did not, but they did not understand, nor did they want to understand what he was talking about. For we heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. Jesus never said that. He said, I will destroy. He said, this temple will be destroyed and he was speaking of his own body, but it will come back in three days. And rather than destroying the customs or the doctrines of, of Moses, he said, I have come to fulfill. In me will be fulfilled all that Moses uh, presented. And so all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin look, look at, looked intently at Stephen, and they saw his face was like the face of an angel. And that convicts me. It puts me in my place when I look at that because having these false accusations come against him, his, his face is radiating like the face of an angel. What does that mean? I believe that there was tremendous peace, that there was purpose, that there was joy, that there was this, this obviously, for, for what he has already seen in his own life and the ministry that God has given to him, now an opportunity. Now there's this opportunity. He's standing there. He has an opportunity to address them. Because in the next verse, chapter 7, we won't go to that part, but in the next, next verse there, or in chapter 7, they say, are these things true? And he opens up and he begins to preach to them a message. He goes all the way back from the beginning of time, comes up through Abraham, comes through Moses, and comes right on down to the day where they live. And then he says, you are no different than all of the rest. The people who are not believers are no different than all the rest who over the years crucified and killed and obliterated those who tried to bring you the truth. And this just causes tremendous rage. And uh, look at chapter 7, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. Now that's getting pretty mad. When you are a, a pretty much a somber, you should be a sophisticated person. You're so angry about it that they're gnashing their teeth at him. But watch this. 
but Stephen. And this is what I want us to see today. Full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God. And Jesus, standing at the right hand of God, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He opened his eyes and he saw the glory of God. Let me burden you with what I believe the glory of God is. That the glory of God is not particularly some aura that sets upon us that people look as a wooey walking in the glory of God. I just see the glory of God. In it. But the glory of God is when God's purpose and God's will is being manifest. That's the glory of God. Moses said, God, show me your glory. And he did. And when he showed him his glory, he said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. God described his glory to him. I will have mercy upon I, whom I will have mercy. I will have judgment upon whom I, ha, I will have judgment. Therefore, the glory of God is this. And it, it, it is the manifestation of God's purpose and God's will. Jesus in John the 13th chapter says, Father, I am about to be glorified. Glorify your name now. And the Father responds so that everyone can hear this voice. I have glorified my name. I am going to glorify my name yet again. And then Jesus says to his disciples, he says, should I pray to the Father that this cup would pass from me or that this thing would pass from me, that I wouldn't have to go through what I'm about to have to go through? No, for this reason I was born. This is my purpose. This is my mission. So I believe the glory of God is moving in us and walking in us and manifest in us. And we see God's glory when we can look at our lives and we can look at ourselves and we can look at our surroundings and we say in that moment, this is what I was born for. This is it. This is it. Doesn't have anything to do with occupation, much to do with occupation or career or anything else. It has to do with my heart set upon simply doing the will of God. But Stephen saw the glory of God. Like Isaiah, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Jesus said in that great priestly prayer in John the 17th chapter, Father, I have received your glory and now I'm giving them your glory. And there's an Old Testament passage that says that he will not give his glory to another. Well, you're not another. You're part of his body. And so Jesus gives you his glory. Today, I want to impart that to you. God's giving you his glory. God is giving you. He has given to you his glory. What does that mean? He's given to you that assurance. You're walking in the perfect, perfect place of his will. Acts the seventh chapter, 57th verse. We're about to close with this. And at this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul, and that is for another day. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Jesus had taught, bless your enemies. He blessed his enemies. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the great saint of God who was imprisoned by the Nazis and actually died in a Nazi prison. He said, if your enemy cannot put up with you any longer and takes to cursing us, then all that we can do is put up our hands and bless them. Put up our hands and bless them. I realize that even as I say that, that we're all having conversations with ourselves because inequity, injustice, and other things may be our lot. But have you tried this, to just put up your hands and bless that person? And because he was willing to forgive, here is a man standing over here. The Bible says that they put their garments at his feet. They dropped their clothing at the feet of Saul. That doesn't mean that he was just guarding their clothes. It meant that he was the instigator of this whole 
terrible, terrible, tragic thing. He was the instigator. And yet, yet, the prayer of Stephen as he's being stoned is, Father, do not lay this to their charge. Do not lay this to their charge. There was something that Stephen did to make way for Paul's heart, Saul of Tarsus, who becomes Paul, the apostle, to be touched and transformed. He forgave him. He forgave him. And then I'll close with this one scripture, Acts the 8th chapter, the first verse. And Saul approved of their killing him. And on that great day, uh, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. So here's the glory of God. I, I, I'm not sure that he saw all of it, but there was something within him that said that day, you know, this was meant to be for me, but what is going to happen is that as I envision God's glory in this situation, there's going to be a great and a mighty thing that takes place in the early church that has possibly now become a little bit settled, a little bit comfortable, and is now being ushered out to all of the regions, and in fact, to all of the world. Today, the question is, can we see the glory of God under assault, under accusation, under persecution, under testing, under trial? Are we blessing? Are we cursing? Or can we, we see the glory of God in this situation? I want to pray to that end, that we will see God's glory on each one of our lives. Would, would you stand with me?